We're going to start off with the title song. This is called It's About Time. It's about time to go make some coffee The light's rising up in the sky The wind is just starting to rustle the trees And the birds are just starting to fly And of all of the things that's around me there are few more important than this The words in my head And the tune rolling round It's that something I'd so hate to miss It's about time I brought you the love song It's time that I opened that door And as it falls open my heart flies to you as I couldn't love anyone more. All of these years and it's come down to you. Together we know this is real, this is true. Loving is what we are sent here to do. All of these years comes right down to you. This love song has taken forever, as only you possibly know. As the losses and hurts, and the years that roll by, as the twilight of days always goes. Like a hot cup of tea in the evening With the honey from hard-working bees The love ever soothing You right beside me This grace falls upon me with ease about time I wrote you that love song It's time that I opened that door And as it falls open My heart flies to you As I couldn't love anyone more It's about time I wrote you that love song It's time that I opened that door and as it falls open, my heart flies to you as I couldn't love anyone more. I couldn't love anyone more. So this song is called Pledge. I had the audacity to uh, take the Pledge of Allegiance and take some liberties, if you will. our hearts, the united parts of our body, sensuality, pure desire, one passion under stars, indivisible with loving and trusting for us. I pledge allegiance to 
all my beloved in the collective love of community and to our survival which has to stand one nation under love and commitment to a stronger world in our universe Protect us from hatred, defects. Keep safe all of our tender souls. For loving and giving are the gifts you have left us. We are the keepers, the writers, and the seekers. All of us children of the stars. Cracks in the sky. Sometimes it's so dark, there's no light at the end of your tunnel. Sometimes it's so cold. To the bone. Sometimes you're so sad, you've lost the best thing that you've ever had. Sometimes it's so hard, you just want to go home. Crawl into your bed. Covers up over your head, and you pray for relief for a long dream of sleep. Have tried every way you know how to get out of this hole 
but for now We're just in it too deep So keep your eye on the cracks in the sky Where an angel might slip through and Just when you thought all your chances were shot She'll wrap her soft wings around you Her warm hand on your back Just say a few words Or the soft gift of silence Sit by your side and she'll wait for you to mend in the end. There's no medicine that can heal like the sweet kiss of kindness. It seals up that dark hole so you can start over again. You belong to the band of the broken hearted. They will open their arms to you. It's a blessing and a privilege to keep their company. You will learn this too. So keep your eye on the cracks in the sky where an angel might. Hello, I'm Mary Valier Kaplan, and on behalf of the Monadnock Summer Lyceum Committee, I would like to welcome you to our 2020 season. We have a great lineup of speakers, and then in February, everything changed. However, our amazing volunteer committee immediately focused not on if, but how to continue the Monadnock Summer Lyceum's mission to inspire, to engage, and to inform our community through thoughtful speakers and programs, and at the same time, maintain the health and safety of the community. Yes, we are going to miss being in the historic Peterborough Unitarian Universalist Church on a summer Sunday morning. And I know I'm gonna miss seeing all of you and engaging the speaker in conversation in the reception that follows over the wonderful food that's so generously provided by local restaurants and organizations. But we still can be together. We can talk about the program afterwards during the week with our friends and family, and you can submit questions and the speaker will provide you answers. However, they're gonna be in electronic format this year rather than the yellow card that is run forward by our able ushers during the question and answer session. All of our speakers and moderators said, let's do it. Our sponsor said, we're 100% behind you. And so the committee has spent this spring working extremely hard and taking all of the traditional elements of the Lyceum that we know you love and converting them to the live stream program that you are about to experience. We hope that you enjoy it and we look forward to being with you again next year in person. So go get a cup of coffee, cup of tea or whatever, find a comfy chair on your porch or your patio and enjoy this today's speaker. And when you are finished, we would appreciate your going to the website or go to our Facebook page and let us know how we can make this experience even better for you. Leave us your email address if you're so willing so we can keep in touch. Also, we'd love to have ideas from about speakers and topics for next year. And we would just appreciate 
if you would stop and make a donation on the website to the Lyceum to sustain this wonderful Monadnock summer tradition. Thank you for coming and enjoy today's speaker. Good morning. I'm Tori Herring Smith, your moderator for today, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum with today's guest speaker, Dr. Joanne Berger Sweeney. Before we get started, I'd like to thank today's musicians, Wendy Keith and her alleged band, for recording the music many of you enjoyed while waiting for the live broadcast to begin. Also, thank you to the Reading Foundation for generously supporting today's event. For many years, the Monadnock Summer Lyceum has brought outstanding world-class speakers to the Monadnock region to serve as catalysts to inform, engage, and inspire an active citizenry on local, national, and global issues. The Monadnock Summer Lyceum is supported primarily through contributions from our audience. We deeply appreciate your donations, which this year may be made on our website or by mailing your donation. During this challenging time, we need your help more than ever. Today's talk is being recorded and will soon be available as a podcast and as a video on our website, monadnocklyceum.org. The talk will also be rebroadcast on WSMN next Sunday at 11 a.m and on WUML this coming Wednesday at 10 a.m. As is the tradition of the Lyceum, after the presentation, our speaker will answer questions from the audience. Please submit your questions by using the comments section on Facebook or YouTube, or send them to our email, monlyceum, M-O-N Lyceum, at gmail.com. After the broadcast, you may provide feedback on today's program, suggestions for next summer's speakers, or join our mailing list on our website. Our speaker today is Dr. Joanne Berger Sweeney. It is such a pleasure to be introducing my friend Joanne, the 22nd president of Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. For the past six years, he has led this distinguished liberal arts college with wisdom and foresight. She has, of course, instituted many new programs at Trinity, and I'm not going to describe them all. But when I think of Joanne, I, associated her, I associate her with expanding Trinity's outreach into downtown Hartford. She's transformed Trinity from a relatively isolated castle of learning into an effective community partner. Working with a local community college, Trinity faculty and students endeavor to identify and solve challenging problems identified by the city's residents, ranging from absentee landlords to youth homelessness. Before coming to Trinity, Dr. Berger Sweeney served as Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts and was a member of the Wellesley College faculty for 13 years. She holds an undergraduate degree in psychobiology from Wellesley, a master of public health focused on environmental health sciences from Berkeley, and a PhD in neurotoxicology from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. A pretty admirable record. <laughs> Dr. Berger Sweeney serves on many boards in the Hartford region and was elected to the very prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2018. We are so fortunate that she has found the time and the energy to speak to us today on speech, freedom, and inclusion on college campuses. As you can imagine, leading a college in a time of COVID is no simple task. So please join me in welcoming this remarkable woman, Joanne. Oh, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Tori. Now, I wrote the description to this talk about six months ago. 
and, and what a difference six months makes. We are not together physically, and I miss the opportunity to, that we would have to look each other in the eye during this talk. I really am stunned by the complexity of the current situation. What and how I was thinking about this talk six months ago seems totally irrelevant on July 5th, 2020. But when we think about freedom of speech, academic freedom and inclusion, could there be any more relevant topic right here and right now? I'm sure that everyone watching today would agree that words matter. I'm very sorry not to be there in the Monadnock region in person. It's beautiful and I've spent much time in the region at the Barbara C. Harris Episcopal Camp in Greenfield. And also, if I'm not mistaken, Mount Monadnock was a subject of inspiration to Henry David Thoreau, said to be his favorite mountain. And as such, I assume this region to be a place with a long history of great thinkers. And a lyceum connotes, at least to me, it's where great discussions happen. I thank Tori and Bob Herring Smith for this invitation. We have worked together before in presidential meetings and even before when I was an aspirational president and Tory was one of those wise, experienced presidents that I looked up to. I have to tell you that given how crazy the last few months have been, as a college president, it really has been an unprecedented time. And I might have canceled a kind invitation such as this if it had been from anybody except for um, Tori and Bob. So thank you for inviting me and, um, and I'm doing this for you. So as you have seen, I'm going to speak about speech. First, I'll remind us of some definitions then I'll share some insights, some examples that help us understand some of the nuances of the definitions. Then I'll challenge us to think about living in the nuances a bit and thinking about what speech might mean in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. Then of course, I'm sure Tori may ask me a few questions and then we'll open the floor to your questions and comments. Now I'm going to begin with a disclaimer. I am a neuroscientist. I'm not a social theorist. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a legal scholar. And I don't even play one on television. But I hope to display some of my liberal arts skills by engaging in a subject that is far from my field of study, but very close to my heart. My hope is not to pretend to know all the answers, but to try and ask good questions and stimulate good conversation. So, um, as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz opined, it's always best to start at the beginning. And here, I will begin with a few definitions and context. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution is a part of the Bill of Rights that protects freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and right to petition. For me, first implies primacy the protection of the freedom of speech. It's an inherent human right to voice your opinion publicly without fear of retribution, punishment, or censorship. It has been bred into my generation as a core American value. We have stood up for freedom of speech when it was hard. 
Think about the National Socialist Party of America and the village of Skokie, Illinois in 1977. When a neo-Nazi socialist party invoked the First Amendment to hold a rally in a primarily Jewish suburb of Chicago. Ultimately, they failed to carry through the march in Skokie and held it in Chicago. Now, we all realize and recognize that there are limits to the right to free speech. Every definition of free speech excludes libel, slander, obscenity, incitement, fighting words, classified information, trade secrets, food labeling. So it is not a definition that does not have limitations. At the same time, when I was young and being, I think, in a family of lawyers, I heard a lot about Justice Brandeis, who wrote, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. In other words, how do you combat hate speech? With more speech. But I wanna contrast my views on the freedom of speech and how I grew up with those of my daughter and son who are 23 and 20 years old respectively. From preschool, they learned that words can hurt as much as sticks and stones. They grew up believing that racial prejudice is spread through words and speech as much as through any act of violence. They learned that words can invoke as much fear as violence can. The concept of social justice has been bred into them as a core American value. So my daughter asked me recently how I could consider freedom of speech a core value, especially as a black woman in America. Speech can promote prejudice. Speech can be used to oppress others. Speech can exclude. Speech is free unless it hurts someone else, right? Where is the intersection between freedom of speech and systemic racism? Now let's think of extreme examples that really aren't too extreme. Words can be used to dehumanize an entire race so that one race's life is not as valuable as another race's. You don't just start with inhumane acts of police brutality. It probably started with speech, a narrative, a story about the other and why we need to fear the other who is dangerous. Many in the current generation want to tie Trump's hateful language to the direct outcomes we saw in Charlottesville and tie that hateful speech to the continuum that allowed a policeman to place a knee on the neck of someone who is less than human. You must first dehumanize an individual through acts, but also through speech, before you can justify killing him or her as less than human. As part of the compromise of the Constitutional Convention, I, I think that was 1787, maybe 1786, maybe someone um, listening knows, to get the ratification of the Constitution, Roger Sherman and James Wilson introduced the idea that a slave would count as three-fifths a person for the purpose of apportioning representation in the House of Representatives. Perhaps Wilson and Sherman thought they were coming up with a manner in which to push the Constitution through an important document and the balance between slave and non-slave state representation was important. 
but the result of their speech and their writing in that they devalued a human life of one race versus another. Doesn't it often start with speech, the dehumanization of the other? It starts with words, words that are repeated time and time again until they move from speech to doctrine. Then you've created an entire society, an ecosystem, where one race is less human than another race. But the narrative, the speech, is based on one human being being less valued than another. A couple of weeks ago, my co-author, Sonia Cardenas, and I reminded our readers in a recent op-ed for the Hartford Current that a policeman placing a knee on a black man isn't just a horrific incident that outrages a nation. It's a cumulative series of words and acts of indignation, the words that create the other. Here are some of the comments from this op-ed that we wrote. When we see images of brutality and abuse, like the killing of George Floyd, we distance ourselves from the violence. We see others as the problem and ourselves as part of the solution. We sign statements and join protest. We call for bans on inhumane practices and reforms to punish abusers. We create a world of us versus them placing ourselves safely on the side of all that is good and just and pure. It's easy to be outraged in the face of atrocity. It's more difficult to see how each of us contributes in small and often invisible ways to dehumanizing others. We need to take seriously that George Floyd's death is a metaphor for everyday ways in which people of color just can't breathe freely in our divided democracy. It's time to go further. In a deeply divided society, we all have a responsibility to practice moral humility. None of us is innocent in the continuum of racism. And it's a continuum that began with words as well as with acts. The narrative of racism is an important narrative. We all contribute to the individual injustices and microaggressions that are perpetrated against people of color each and every day. These regular occurrences are evidence in all places and in words at all levels of society affecting the most vulnerable and the most powerful. We use words and actions routinely to undermine people of color and treat them differently. We take steps to render them silent and invisible despite our stated intentions. And we convince ourselves that high standards rather than base prejudice guide us. Our accumulated acts of bias dehumanize others, and they are the building blocks of structural and systemic racism. Exclusionary ways of thinking, which privilege some human beings over others, have become institutionalized and normalized in our society. This is our shared history in the United States, which runs much deeper than the last month or the past four years. Now, I hope you can understand why my daughter asked me how I can reconcile freedom of speech with racial rhetoric in the United States. As you know, not all countries consider free speech as absolute as we do in America. Now, if Wikipedia is right, then in Austria, you're prohibited from calling Prophet Muhammad a pedophile. In the Czech Republic, they curb the rights of hate groups and prohibit 
the public denial of the Holocaust. Finland prohibits blasphemy. Does our freedom of speech harm some Americans more than others? Does our view about the absolutism of freedom of speech actually contribute to the racial problems that we're facing now? Who gets to choose the speech of oppression and decide whether particular words are fighting words or not? Here was my most recent speech controversy on Trinity's campus. Over the last couple of weeks, there was a Black at Trin Instagram page. About one week, maybe it was just a couple of days later, a White at Trin Instagram page started. Now, do both of these sites have the right to exist? Admittedly, I don't control Instagram and I can't take either of them down, but is it really acceptable for me to simply say that they both have the right to exist? Am I actually doing my duty as president if I don't speak out in some way about one site that is sharing some of the pains and racial incidents of a set of students and another site pops up trying to mock some of those very same stories. Now, I thought I would turn my attention a little bit to academic freedom. So I'm president at Trinity College. I've been a tenured faculty member for almost 30 years. What does academic freedom mean? And is it the same as the freedom of speech? Is it different? How is it different? So academic freedom is a moral and legal concept, underscoring the freedom of inquiry by faculty members, recognizing that that freedom of inquiry is essential to the mission of the academy, as well as the principles of academia, and that scholars should have freedom to teach or communicate ideas or facts without being targeted for repression, job loss, or imprisonment. While the core of academic freedom covers scholars acting in an academic capacity, as teachers or researchers expressing strictly scholarly viewpoints, an expansive interpretation extends these occupational safeguards to scholars' speech on matters outside of their professional expertise. And some people consider it a type of freedom of speech. Academic freedom is a contested issue and therefore does have its limitations in practice here in the United States. For example, it's widely recognized that teachers should be careful to avoid controversial matters that are unrelated to subject being discussed or the subjects of their expertise. When they speak or write in public, they're free to express their opinions without fear of institutional censorship or dis uh, discipline, but they should show restraint and clearly indicate that they are not speaking on behalf of their institution. An interesting aspect of academic freedom for particularly those who consider themselves absolutist are that the ability of a faculty member to control not just what they teach, but almost every aspect of their teaching environment. For example, some people think that we cannot force any faculty member to come to teach on campus in the fall, given the COVID crisis, without impinging on his or her academic freedom. So does academic freedom really cover every condition of a professor's work environment? That's a question we can ask. And let's talk about some of the limits of academic freedom. For example, it preserves your right to 
speak in class and speak about controversial subjects. However, you can't teach that the world is flat if that is not an agreed upon doctrine by geographers. Now, can you teach creationism in a religion class? How about a biology class? Here's another example of a recent controversy about um, freedom, academic freedom. And that is whether faculty members should be required to give trigger warnings or not. I always thought of an example from my classroom as a science professor. In my upper division neuroscience courses, we would do animal surgeries in some of those courses. We would implant small devices in the brains of rats and the rats would survive and we would do experiments. Can you imagine that I wouldn't tell my students that we were planning to do work on live animals in a particular class? Some of them may not want to do it. Um, I had to make sure for example, that students ate a meal before attempting the surgery um, because I have seen people pass out in situations like this. Is this a trigger warning? Don't I have the right to make sure and don't my students have the right to not participate in those kinds of surgeries if they don't want to? Clearly, these are complicated issues. So, where does this lead me? In conclusion, what I wanna share with you is that our freedoms are not inflexible, even when these freedoms are written into our laws. Our freedoms are not absolutes. They come with responsibilities, they come with consequences. We are not simply a legal society, we aim to be a moral and ethical society. And if you stop and think about it, you can't just give people lo laws and rules and think that makes them ethical. I think this way of thinking is part of the Frankfurt School of Social Theory. In the 1920s and 30s, this school of thought was critical of both capitalism and of Marxist-Leninist theory because they were philosophically inflexible systems of social organization. Now, without getting heavily into social theories of Eugen Habermas, my simple interpretation of his work is that democracy lives and breathes in how it is communicated. In other words, it lives in the words that you use to communicate democracy. It's about the speech. We can't legislate ethics because ethics is really about social norms. We can't, as I said, give people laws and think that giving them laws make them ethical. Now here, I'm not advocating that we suspend our freedom of speech or academic freedom, but I am very wary of the absolutism that I think I grew up with. The classic limitation of freedom of speech as not yelling fire in a crowded building is not sufficient for us to create a moral society. I don't think that we're going to create racial justice by letting everyone say anything that they want because there is a differential of power as context for that speech. If we're interested in instituting cultural change, the kind of change that is necessary to bring about racial justice and to be actively anti-racist, the language we use to dehumanize others does make a difference and we can encourage or prevent the cultural change we want you to see, we want to see. 
Maybe, just maybe, my children are wiser than I am about this matter. They have certainly made me stop and ask questions about my belief. We all understand that freedom comes with responsibility. The question is how we will use ours. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And what a pleasure to hear you talk again. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have lots of questions coming in, but I thought I'd start off by really asking you a little bit more about the confrontation between black at Trin and white at Trin. Mm -hmm. um, you aren't the czar of Instagram. <laughs> so as you say, <laughs> you couldn't take them down. What did you do? Right. Um, actually, I ended up writing a letter to the community um, along with our, you know, kind of dean of students and our um, vice president, well, it's really a vice president position for enrollment and student success, and our vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and said we weren't very proud of in response to one group trying to share their pain, even if you don't agree with everything that was said, to create an alternate mocking site just didn't make us very proud. So we did end up um, not eliminating people's right to freedom of speech, but saying that we supported one of these sites more than we supported the other. Interesting. Did you have a response from of White? Of course we did. <laughs> Was everybody happy with what or how I said things? Of course they were not. Um, but you know, it it was something that the three of us decided we needed to do. And then um, this past Wednesday, I wrote a longer, more detailed uh, speech or, or detailed letter uh, about um, kind of my beliefs and why I was actually hopeful in light of what was happening in the country and how I hoped that this was a platform for real change in society. And I listed the things that I committed to do in response to what we were seeing both on campus and outside of campus. And then our board of trustees the next day wrote a letter supporting my letter. So that's, as I listen to you and I think about your comments about social norms, that really mm -hmm. social norms as much as laws um, influence our sense of not only legality, but ethical behavior. Right. So is that your method as an educator of defining social norms? Absolutely. So I thought it was important, um, kind of how my letter started was listing the things that I believe in. That's great. And, um, you know, I'll tell you one of them, the first one. So for me, primacy was higher education has the power to transform individuals and to transform society. And particularly those of us interested in liberal arts education, we have it demands a sense of humanity. It, it demands an understanding, a compassion to listen with an open heart, empathetically imagining what it's like for someone else to experience the world and then to act upon it. Interesting. And then I have a number of other principles, um, but eventually I say I'm hopeful because I believe fervently that higher education can be in the forefront of studying and addressing systemic racism in the United States. That sounds great. Well, I hope you get some responses to that. One of our viewers, as a matter of fact, have, has asked, would you share our letter with the community after the broadcast? Absolutely. I will, Tori, I will um, email you a copy because it went out to the entire Trinity community, not just our on campus community, but all of our key volunteers, all of our alumni. Um, and I just shared with them this is what I believe, and this is why 
I'm hopeful. That's great. Well, I know that it, at least one viewer, and I'm sure many more, would love to um, love to see your comments. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a number of questions, and um, one asked also about an issue you brought up in your speech, which was faculty returning to campus. Mm -hmm. Did you decide that was a <laughs> an issue of academic freedom? How did you deal with that? What is Trinity going to do? Yeah, well, you know, I decided whether it was a matter of academic freedom or not, that we needed to give people the right to determine whether they should come back to campus or not. And because it is possible to teach many courses in a remote fashion, I decided that it wasn't worth forcing people to be on campus. I think, I think our faculty members will make that determination based on perhaps the type of course they're teaching. What I asked was that, or what you know, I asked along with the, the dean of the faculty is look department by department and mm. try and make sure that each department has some remote classes and some in-person classes. But I did say, if people are going to teach remotely, they had to undergo training over the summer to oh, be good. able to do it well. Because for me, it's more important that it's a high quality teaching experience than whether it is literally online or not online. That sounds great. And did some faculty agree to be trained? Oh, I, I, I think we said if you are planning to teach remotely, that no choice. Is, there, I, you know, I don't think there can be a choice to that. Yeah. We're going to have to have certain standards for being able to offer those courses. But I understand that it and it's not just people who are of a certain age or have underlying health conditions, there are also some psychological barriers to who might want to come back to, to campus. And I would say that's not just for faculty members, that's also for students. And I wanted to make sure that our staff understood that if there work could be done from home that we would engage in those discussions too. So interestingly, um, even though I'm not sure I would qualify that as an issue of academic freedom, it just felt like the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, we have uh, we have so many questions coming in. I want to, to get to them. Um, one, a broad question that sort of resonates through others, it says, do we need laws to prohibit racism or will cultural change be significant or be sufficient? Sufficient. Uh -huh. sufficient. Yes, it, it'll be significant, but right. we need sufficient. Um, um, we need laws? Fundamentally, I think we need both. I think we do need laws. I mean, I think the laws that were passed here in the United States in the 1960s made a difference. I think voting rights and laws make a difference. I think the laws about ending apartheid in South America make, uh, South Africa, sorry, um, you know, absolutely make a difference. But they don't in and of themselves change behavior, all behaviors. Um, they do help to institute, I think, societal norms, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the fact that we are a country where I hope the rule of law is precedent, then yeah, it, it, it does make a, a difference. Now, I will share with you, as I think I might have said in just one line of uh, my speech. My father um, was a lawyer and his first job out of law school was with the Urban League in Los Angeles. My two brothers are lawyers. 
Um, I have countless um, cousins and uncles and relatives. And I think so many of us, excluding me, so many of them went into the legal profession because they believed that changing laws was actually going to help reduce prejudice and improve racial justice in the country. That is the way that my, con my family has chosen to address many of those issues. But I think what I wanted to say is that alone can't do it. Because you see with all of the changes in laws that had been made, there's now, there is something of a rhetoric in the US all the way, you know, from the top of our country that is changing people's interpretations of those laws. And it's changing the ways that people are acting. And one of our questioners gets to that um, and says, in discussions with the under 30 generation, mm -hmm. um, they seem to react to insensitive or nasty speech, not as incitement to violence, but as violence itself. It's help. Ex thank you for uh, whoever said that. that. I think that's what I was trying to articulate. That is beautifully said. And how do, you, how do you respond to that, especially in an educational institution? You know, I, I'm not sure I have the perfect answer. What I do want to say is that it made me stop and think. I started having these discussions and arguments with my 22 year old. And instead of, I'm mom, I'm a president, I have a PhD, I'm a professor. Obviously, I'm all right about this. I had to stop and think. I, I, it really made me stop and view the world a little bit differently. And, and what I was trying to share in my speech was how it made me stop and think and say, wow, maybe there's somewhere in between or in the middle of these two points of view, maybe the absolutism that I thought I was bringing into my views of the freedom, uh, about freedom of speech, don't say it all. I, I don't know, Tori, have, have you had interactions with people of that generation and had these kinds of discussions? It's it really, it's really hard as we were talking, you know, a couple of weeks ago I, and you asked that question. So I began to think <laughs> that uh, being retired three years, it's amazing how much you can forget. Um, but I do remember one of the toughest things that I dealt with on the campus was an incident it, which was in which exactly as this viewer says, uh, students viewed something as an act of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was our president of the student government, who was a white male graduating senior, had a little bit too much to drink one night, how unusual on a college campus, mm -hmm. um, saw a poster that was advertising an event for black life or black light golf. Apparently play golf and black, I have no idea what black light golf is, but <laughs> he took a pen out and, and the spokesperson or the advocate for this was Tiger Woods. So there was a picture of Tiger Woods on the poster. And so he took his, his pen and he he blacked out light. So it said black golf, then took a picture of it, posted it. Well, it was a very tense time in, in racial relations. What time is it these days? Right. Um, and so I had to go to him and he was an extremely successful student who had just academically and socially who had just won a number of honors and tell him that he couldn't do that as a leader, as the president of the student government, mm -hmm. that, that he was in a different, that the way, the response he would have to make would have to be much more dramatic than what a student who didn't hold that position or have earned those honors would have to do. In other words, he was a model. Mm -hmm. 
And he had to take that responsibility. Your last line about, you know, freedom of speech is responsibility. Right. So I told him he had to resign. Wow. And initially wow. he refused. And he said he thought his argument was a good one. He said he thought he could do more by remaining and leading efforts to talk more about racial issues on mm -hmm. campus. I said, mm -hmm. I accepted that, but he could do that not from the current position. And it took a long time and many discussions with his parents. And he did eventually resign. And then he went to law school, but he took a year off. Mm -hmm. Because of course, that disciplinary action appeared on his transcript and had to be reported to law schools. Mm -hmm. um, I then wrote a letter of recommendation for him mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. talked about the incident and, and what he had learned. Wow. Um, that, was, that, was, that was a pretty you know brave move. Um, on your part to ask him to resign because, you know, and I'm glad you shared, it was difficult for him. You had to suffer the parents' indignation, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure you were told he will never get into law school. You're ruining his life and his oh. entire future. Um, that That's that's pretty brave. That's but he did get into law school and he's doing fine. Yeah. And, he, and I think he learned something. And he learned a lot. Yeah. I think of the, I've read in the press recently about many um, students who've been admitted to certain institutions, then posted racist comments on their social media and have then been, had their admission rescinded. Rescinded. Exactly. Interesting. I, I heard about that. You know, I'm happy to say I have not had to do that or face that. Um, but yes. I, I have heard in other institutions just recently. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it was interesting that I think the president of one of the universities that had done just that said freedom of response, a freedom of speech is not freedom from consequence. From consequences. Exactly. And I thought that was very good. One of our viewers wants to know if you've had freedom of speech issues with the student press. Um, not so much with our student press. Uh, they, the role that we have tried to take with our student press is to ensure that what they say, they can back up. I, I love how quickly many of those in our student newspaper write sometimes they don't always follow up and ensure that the facts are correct or that they have you know done their research so i find most of the issues that we've had with our student press really are about fact checking and say you can express your opinions but make sure that you've backed them up um, yeah. with information but it was it was uh, difficult and challenging because during this whole um, COVID crisis and pandemic, where we made it clear that we were having budgetary issues, they decided to go to our 990 forms, publish my salary, and say what salary cut they thought I should take based on what they had heard from one or two other, um, you know, presidents. So did I like it? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did, did I like so publicly, um, you know, having that in the student newspaper? Did I even question in my own mind, since I hadn't seen that about any of the white officers of the college, whether there was some interaction, um, you know, between race, sexism, and, you know, kind of displaying salaries, but I certainly wasn't going to stop them from um, printing it. Yeah, yeah, sounds like a wise move. I wanna move back actually to the very first question that was asked, but it was so broad, I thought we'd deal with some of the others first. Okay. Um, and the question was, how have the attitudes of incoming students about racism changed um, over your career? And mm -hmm. what challenges remain? And how do you approach those challenges as an educational institution? 
Wow. Good question. So that I is a big question. That. And and I might have to ask you to like ask it of me in pieces. Okay. So the first part is how have things changed? Um so one thing that I will tell you is over my, you know, almost 30 year career as an educator, there is no question that at primarily white institutions, and you have heard that I'm currently at Trinity College. I was at Tufts University, their School of Arts and Sciences before that. And before that, I taught and spent 19 years at Wellesley College. Now, those three institutions are certainly primarily white institutions. And I have seen more people of color, more socioeconomic diversity, and more international diversity over my 30 year career. There is no question that these institutions that many consider very selective, I don't like to use the word elite, but very selective, primarily white institutions, there are without doubt more people of color, more people on the socioeconomic spectrum, um, and more international students at all of our institutions over this period of time. So our institutions look different. And I will tell you because all three of these institutions that I've mentioned to you are private institutions. It means that we are using a significant portion of our own financial aid money that comes through generous donations across generations of our alumni and friends, it, it was, much of it was purposeful. We decided we wanted a broader socioeconomic spectrum at our institutions. And because of the demographics of the United States, when you had a broader socioeconomic um, spectrum. When you started giving out more financial aid, you indeed had a broader racial spectrum. And has that broadened students' attitudes toward racism? You know, it's interesting. Um, one thing that I will tell you, and this is a little bit about United States demographics. We have fewer people now than 30 years ago who consider themselves truly middle class. Mm. We have more extremism, the very wealthy and the very poor. And we do see that more in our institutions, that financial aid goes to people who are on the very needy end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum are those who don't need um, financial aid. Fewer and fewer people fall into what would be middle class. And as our institutions, some of these private institutions became more and more expensive, more and more people have been squeezed out of education who used to be considered middle class, that now even middle class people can't always afford the kinds of tuition and room and board that we have. So what, me, what it means is that our institutions have become, instead of one might think of you know bell-shaped where the majority of people are middle income in the middle, it's become really more barbell and if you think about it, if you have a more barbelled population, there's less to bridge the divides in between, and there is more tension. And the more extreme our country becomes socioeconomically, the more you see that displayed in our institutions of higher education and the bigger the gap in between. 
and, and that's expressed, I assume, in, in attitudes toward race as well as class, as well as, yeah. Exactly. And I think we all know we, there was a terrific study that came out of UCLA maybe three years ago, and they were looking at the politics of students coming into college. And each and every year in the last five years, those two populations have become more divided, more extreme on each end. And the more extreme and the less you talk about commonalities, the more stark everything becomes in our campus, on our campuses. And um, one of the things we tried to do at Trinity to counter this was start a series called Bridging Divides, mm. in which we were just trying to have people with different points of view come together. And, and as I said, one of my principles, try and imagine and empathize what it's like to be in someone else's shoes, mm -hmm. to walk with them uh, just a little bit on the other side. That is what I think higher education can bring. Wow. I mean, that's why I'm hopeful. And that's <laughs> why I'm in higher education. That's great. I, I, I really want, I want to end on that, but we have one last question that I don't want to overlook. Because okay. two people have asked, uh, essentially about how you deal with speakers on campus. Um, you know, how do you uh, prepare for controversial speakers like Charles Murray at Middlebury? Who is who allowed to speak on campus? So this will be our last question. Right. And we have not restricted anyone from speaking on our campus. Period. And what do you do if students come in and interrupt? Right. You know, is it well, we have certain guidelines. If we think someone is going to be highly controversial, um, which we which happened, I think about two years ago, we had to set up um, our campus safety. How will the person exit? Um, I know some people have gone to the extreme where someone is in another room giving the speech, um, and you know, so that they are allowed to to continue their speech. Now that being said, I that is how we we have handled it in the past. I need to think about that. I need to think about how to deal with that in the future. Um, and, and it does depend on where you are. We are here in the middle of Hartford, Connecticut, in a city. How do you deal with that? Let's say in Monadnock region in New Hampshire, do you use all of the police force of New Hampshire <laughs> to yeah. address a speaker that would be on a campus somewhere in New Hampshire. Is that fair? Is that right? But imagine if it was someone controversial and you've seen some of these things turn um, a bit to, to more violent behavior. So at what point does the inst academic institution have a responsibility to the town, the neighborhood, the state in which they live in terms of resources? All of these things are very complicated issues. And I, as I promised from the beginning, I was not going to have all the answers. <laughs> well, I think we've gotten a small window, Joanne, into the difficulty of being a college president today. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for bringing your really very um, insightful comments about freedom of speech to us. I know I'm left with many, many more questions. I wish we could keep going. <laughs> We are at time. We are at time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope this format, you know, worked. I know it's not like being there in person, but uh, I certainly have enjoyed at least the time with you, Tori. So thank you. Thank you so much. Now, our speaker next Sunday will be Jim Rooney, whose talk is entitled From Homer to Hank Williams 
thoughts about singing and songwriting. And I understand he's gonna be playing some guitar to accompany himself. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast of the Monadnock Summer Lyceum. Thank you again for your support of our unique 2020 season. We hope to see you again back, back again next week. Thank you.